Tonight I'm going to talk about uh, what it means to be sons and daughters of God and the glory of God, which is our inheritance. Um, but I want to review before we get there. And if you look at your notes and you turn on to the last sheet in the back, it talks about levels of authority for a city-reaching intercessor. Our purpose in coming in, I mean, the whole reason for having this seminar, it's more than, uh, it, it, is it fits into the the move of God and the strategic plan that the Lord is putting together to reach Elk River for Jesus Christ so that Elk River can then be a detonator as it is being for the entire Twin Cities Metroplex area. Amen? And so it can reach the whole nation. Amen? So that our nation can reach the nations and Jesus can come back in the clouds and we can have a big party. Amen? So that's why we're doing this. It's that simple. But what we've seen in cities around the world, when pastors come together and they embrace these principles from the Bible of unity, and they say, we're not, one, we're not various churches, we're one church, we're various congregations, and they come together and they begin to step out and they begin to mobilize prayer, immediately the Lord blesses that. Something happens in the spiritual realm and blessings are, reached, are, are released over the city and they begin to move forward. And it's like Satan is pushed back. But what we've seen in every city, it's, it's after Satan is pushed back, it's like he recruits more demons, or, you know, I don't know how he does it, or whatever. But there's a retaliation. And we've seen he comes out with everything he has to attack the pastors. We've seen it in city after city. And we can tell you horror story after horror story of terrible, terrible things that pastors who stood, stepped out and chosen to take the lead in city-reaching efforts have had to go through, personally, in their churches. I mean, we've had churches burned down. and things, I mean, we didn't have them. I mean, but the church, we didn't have any. We don't take any responsibility for that. But, I mean, things like that have happened. But what we've seen is that in the same way that pastors need to come together if we're going to reach our city and be the gatekeepers to move forward to legislate in the heavenlies over the city and then to mobilize prayer for the city, in the same way that that is important, it is equally important for intercessors to come together along the same lines and to begin to do that. And what we've seen is when the intercessors are able to come together and underneath the covering of the pastors, and then underneath the, spirit, the headship of the pastors, so they're covered by them, one is this group of intercessors then has an authority that no one individually, no one group, no one church would have individually. When they come together underneath the covering of the pastors, they have an authority that they never had before. And then they, in turn, in their intercession, become like a spiritual covering, like a, like a you know... Um, a secret service in the spiritual realm for the, the pastors and the leaders. And then what happens is then the pastors see a freedom that they never had before. And it's like the, uh, the Bible says that what Satan meant for evil, God will turn around for good. But and it's, then it is like the retaliation that the devil brings, that if it had hit the pastors alone, it would have been too much for them. Or if it hit the intercessors alone, it would have been too much for them. But when they come together, it's like, then it's like it's over the hump and the very things that Satan means for evil are the things that catapult us to the next level. And I'm also here to share that we have seen wonderful, wonderful results in that area. For example, we were in one city and we just had a small group of pastors come together but they, you know, to, to begin the first steps of reaching their city. And we had a group of intercessors, a seminar sem similar to this. And with just a handful of pastors, about three of them, and with a small group of intercessors, about 20 of them, we did reconciliation between the pastors and the intercessors. You know, and the pastors repented of being controlling and not releasing them and, and saying they didn't need prayer and, you know, whatever they could think of that was sinful. They repented of that. And then the intercessors repented of gossip and, and all those nasty things that we do to undermine the authority of the pastors. And it was great. Everyone was weeping. And then we took these three pastors, we put them in the middle, we laid hands on them and then we just started to bless them and man it was it was a holy spirit time i mean you know weeping i mean snot the whole nine yards it was wonderful we were just praying god bless these guys and then by faith we said now lord 
we raise up a canopy of intercession over all the pastors in all the city. And we just did it by faith. How did we do it? Like I just said it. And we said, Lord, this prayer that is touching these three men, let it be applied to every pastor in the city, you know? And it felt good when we prayed it, so we felt that was cool. And then, anyways, what we didn't know, know, what we don't know. At that moment, there was another pastor as part of the church of the city who wasn't very much interested in the city reaching effort. In fact, he was in clearly in a whole nother world. In fact, he was in a hotel about to check in in the lobby with a woman who was not his wife. He, was, he had the money out and was about to pay for the room. And at the moment we prayed, as far as we can calculate, he, according to his own words, became arrested by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's like his eyes were opened up and he says, what am I doing? And suddenly he could see his sin for what it was, and he, such a conviction came over him. He says, I can't go through with this. And he excused himself, and he's half confused. He says, God, what do I do? And in this moment of confusion, God spoke to his heart and says, I want you to go to, and he gave the name of the church, the church we were meeting. I want you to go to Living Waters. It wasn't Living Waters, but I want you to go to such and such a church. He shows up half an hour later. I mean, we're having a meeting, and the guy walks through the door in the back, and, you know, we don't notice anything. He asked for the pastors. By that time, the pastor was back at his office. The others had left. We send him down there. He walks into this pastor's office, walks up to his desk, lays $50 down on the table, starts to weep, and says, makes a full confession, tells him everything, and says, I want to repent, and I want to be restored. And they end up weeping and praying and weeping and praying for hours and hours, long into the night, made a covenant to walk together in unity, to hold each other accountable to holiness, and then to together take the point to, you know, together to confront the iniquity that unfortunately is far too common in our churches. You see, and so now the very thing that Satan was coming and saying, oh boy, they're going to reach their city. Well, I got a few tricks up my sleeve. I'm going to disqualify them before they go there. And Satan, and the Lord says, no, what you meant for evil, I'm going to use for good. And see, that is the power. I mean, if just a small group come together, nowhere near the representation we have in Elk River, and a small group of intercessors, nowhere near the representation we have here in Elk River, If that can happen when they come together, now imagine, we've all heard the horror stories. We all, I mean, from every group, every church, we've, you know, every background, you know, we've seen it. But the story I just shared is one you're not going to hear about in the news. But folks, that is the power that is released. So that's our goal of what we want to see put in place. And what we have seen is in intercession, there is a need for it to be properly underneath the covering of the pastors. So this is the vision that the pastors are are moving ahead with, is to acknowledge and release these coordinators, who each of them have influence in their individual congregations. And then this group is then going to come together regularly. We don't know the exact plans then. To intercede for the pastors, on behalf of the pastors, and for the city, but underneath the covering of these pastors. Now back to the last page of your notes. What is the strategy? And, and it's about being a spiritual father. Lear- intercession is learning how to be a spiritual parent and take an, uh, take an ownership and learn how to exercise the authority for those you're interceding for. And what we've found to intercede effectively for a city is so many times intercessors come together to pray for a city, but their prayers are less effective than they could be, and many times they even get sidetracked, so instead of... Uh, you you know, they're doing as much damage as they are doing good. And what we've seen is many times it's because of lack of understanding of these principles of intercession and our prayers, we come together to pray for the city, but it's so vague, we don't even really know what we're praying for. We're just praying for some vague thing. And if you don't know what you're praying for, how are you going to know when God answers? So what we've found is the first level of authority that we have to gain The first place that we have to learn what it means to be a spiritual father or a spiritual mother or a spiritual parent is in the area of our family. Then the next level is in the area of our neighborhood. And I won't ask you to raise your hands, but how many in here are being a lighthouse of prayer to your neighbors, to the people you work with? And if you're not, then I 
challenge you to become one. Because how can we pray effectively for the city, for a revival in the city, if the ones the Lord has sovereignly placed around us, we don't have a compassion for? You know, it's the, whole the, 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 the application of the message last night. Put a face to the revival. Then after your neighborhood, then before you can pr uh, pray effectively for the city, we have to gain authority in the area of intercession for our congregation, our local congregation, and our pastor. In other words, you know, forget about praying for revival in the city if you're angry at your pastor. We need to learn how to be life givers, to learn how to intercede and to, and to stand and support the vision of another. Not because he's perfect, because if you go to a church, your pastor's not perfect but to understand that he is called and anointed by God and to be able to stand and intercede on behalf of that. Then the next level is to intercede for the church of the city and the pastors of the city. In other words, we're not going to be able to pray effectively for the city if we're sectarian. If we believe, oh, my denomination is called and the others are almost called and they'll be truly called when they become like us. If we have that mindset, you know, we're disqualified. Because we don't understand grace. We don't understand, you know, uh, uh, the call of God and, the, 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 and, and what it means that if we really did receive something more, then we are called to be greater servants to the rest. And so we need to, to understand that each member of the body of Christ fulfills a unique position and is uniquely called of God, and we cannot be one body without one another. You know, and... Ed Savoso has taught so sufficiently on that, that you understand that. But then after we gain authority in these four levels, then we can pray effectively for the city. And I've found that if we understand that, then we can pray with confidence, knowing that when we pray for the city, we're not going to get destroyed by God, be destroyed by the enemy, because we're in line with the, with the calling of God. So, what we were sensing is that to mobilize an intercessory prayer strategy for the city but in a very specific way in underneath these coordinators to assign specific prayer tasks for the cities for different groups of intercessors for example have one group of intercessors who would pray specifically for the prisons another group that would pray specifically for the schools another group that would pray for this and for that because then when we begin to pray focus things so that we can un hear and, and d discern what the will of God is and pray very specifically, then when the answer comes, we'll say, oh, we'll know that was by the will of God. And it won't just be a vague type of thing. And so our th Brother Arthur Burke, who you'll hear, be hearing more about this, this is just a preview of coming, coming attractions. He's going to be coming in later on in the year, and he's going to have a seminar, and he has tremendous, tremendous understanding and discernment in that area about prayer strategies. But where I sense we're at right now is before we can get there, before we can effectively mobilize a strategy for the city, we have to hit these four levels. And so that between now and then, we need to concentrate on praying for our families, praying for our neighbors, praying for our pastor, gaining authority so that when there's a problem in the church, you are a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Praying for the church in the city, and then in that context, praying for the city. Amen? Does that sound good? All right. Well, what I want to... Um, speak on today is being sons and daughters of God, what it means that we were born again. I mean, back to the cross again. What did Jesus do for us on the cross? And my message has three points. First of all, is that our inheritance is far greater than we yet understand. Can we all, you know, we've all, to one degree or another, have tasted the fruits of the Spirit. We've tasted the fruits of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen? But can we all agree that however much I have, there's a lot more that I don't have yet? That's my first point. Our, my second point is that we're much more screwed up than we yet understand. <laughs> we have a tremendous inheritance. Why aren't we walking it out? We have an inheritance greater than what we yet know. Well, <laughs> the effects of sin... See, we need to, first of all, encounter God. 
see him in his glory. And not just see him in his glory, but look into his eyes the way Isaiah did. And we're going to see him in his power and in his glory, but when we look into his eyes, we're also going to see his love. And we're going to see that he is our daddy. And it's not, you know, one without the other is not enough. But we have to see that's his glory and that's who I am. And it's out of that encounter and that, 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 that it's like a revelation through the Holy Spirit where we see God for who he is and we see that he is our father. That then out of that we turn and say, Woe unto me, I am so sinful. And we see the magnitude that, that, of which sin has corrupted us because that is who we were created to be. And we're not walking it out. So that's my second point, is that we're far screwed up, more screwed up than we yet understand. And then my third point is that Jesus did more for us on the cross than we yet understood. The redemption and the power that was provided for us in the blood of Jesus is far greater than what we've yet walked in. There's more power than what we've yet stepped out into. Amen? So I want to give you a little background from where I'm coming from. If you look on, for, if you look on your notes, what I'm going to be covering is, um, is related to, the la to, to principles. Let me see where I have this in my notes to principles 11 and 12 about being that as children we have access to the unlimited resources of God and that principle number 12 the Lord is the only object of our reverence and fear um, but first of all to share a little bit about where I'm coming from I when I first accepted the Lord you know I was I grew up in the church you know and I was not into you know any you know I, the major things of the world but I knew that Although I grew up in the church, there was a certain point in junior high and high school where, for all practical purposes, I rejected the gospel. And I took control of my life, and I was going to live it my own way. And I know that, you know, I mean, alcoholism wasn't my problem, you know, it wasn't things like that. It was really basketball. And that was my God. And I was living for myself. And, you know, that can, it was actually, on one side, a really good thing because, because of that, the Lord protected me from so, so many other things. But I know, when I look back, that I had seared my conscience so much that there was very, very few limits of things I would not do to serve myself. If something I felt benefited me, I had... And I look back, and I'm really frightened, you know, to see, you know, when I see how, how, what I was capable of that, at that time. And then out of that, in that context, the Lord came to me, and, you know, when I was 19, he, he, he reached out, and, and it was really giving me an, a revelation that I was captive to sin, and I knew I wanted to be set free. And then when I gave my life to the Lord, he, he set me free, and he delivered me from so many things. And so, when I was a new believer, like so many of you, I knew that if I was talking to an alcoholic, I knew from the Bible that what God had done in my life must apply to him. And although I wasn't in the exact same situation, God set me free, and I knew I had no strength to get free myself, but he had done it. And if he had done it to me, I knew he would do it to them. Remember, we all used to be there when we were first saved. We all believed that the most hardened sinner, if they would accept Jesus, would be instantly delivered. But then reality sets in. And I remember when I first began to minister, I was working as a missionary in the nation of Portugal. Um, I, had, uh, I had, when I was in college, the opportunity to, to, to go down to Argentina. Um, I'm regressing a little right now. When I was in college, I was a brand new believer in 1990, I had my chance to make the first missions trip uh, that I went on down to Argentina. And I got to go to the city of Resistencia. So if you've read Ed Silvoso's book, you know, you know about the city of Resistencia. I was there, you know, he mentions the basketball team in that book. Well, I was playing on that. And so I got to go down there as a brand new believer and see the revival and the power of God. And it, it, it really changed my life. I mean, to see the hunger that the people had for the Lord, and, and especially in the young people, there was such a fire. I remember talking to one 12-year-old. He didn't want to talk about basketball or anything else. He just wanted to talk about reaching his nation. And I looked in his eyes, and there was fire, you know. And I, that just blew me away. It was, so, it, was, it was just so powerful. I'd never seen that before. 
So, but it didn't, I didn't have a context to really understand what had happened there. I just, it was a wonderful experience. I was touched by God, but I didn't know the Holy Spirit. I didn't know revival. I didn't know what was going on. I just thought it was a good time. But then, later on, about four years later, I was working as a missionary in the country of Portugal. And Portugal is, is a very, very closed nation to the gospel. Culturally, the people are Catholic, but, you know, they're, they're atheists as well. They're fervent Catholics and atheists at the same time. Figure that out, you know. And fervent communists, you know. But <laughs> and working there was so difficult. I mean, trying to get someone to come to the church. I mean, we'd talk to them, and I'd make friends with them, and they'd, you know, they, they'd, they'd accept the Lord, I'd pray with them, but then trying to get them to come to our church was like trying to pull teeth, you know. It, maybe they'd show up once, and then we'd never see them again. And, and then... Also, people would have, you know, we had an inner city, we had a church in the middle of the city, so people with life-dominating problems, and we're talking about prostitutes and drug addicts would come in, and I was so zealous, I had so much faith that if they accepted the Lord, I would pray for them, and boom, they'd be transformed. But I began to see that there was, it didn't happen. And I was trying to figure out, Lord, why doesn't it happen? How come the gospel, which is so powerful for me, is not powerful for them? And yet they would say the prayers. They would, and I, as far as I could tell, I couldn't say that they weren't making a sincere decision. Because I knew that when I made my decision, it was only half sincere, but the Lord made it sincere. And I wasn't able to say that like so many others said, well, they're, you know, they're, they're just not true. You know, they don't really, you know, they haven't come to that place. Or Maybe that's true, but I, that just didn't resolve the issue for me. It seemed that there had to be a power that I was not laying hold of yet. And then in the context of this, the Lord began to, to teach me more about the principles of spiritual warfare. It was in that context that I read Ed's book, That None Should Perish, where he talks about what's going on in the spiritual realms. And that impacted me so much because I was living in a before picture of the revival. And I'd experienced an after picture of the revival. And then he explains how you go from the before to the after. And that just hit me so powerfully. And I said, these people went to that which I saw in Argentina and just blew me away. But then I also read a book, um, probably many of you have read it, by Neil Anderson. And it's about uh, bondage breakers. And for the first time, I began to see the spiritual forces behind the fruit that we see. And I was able to see that people aren't just captive to sin, but they're captive to spiritual forces stronger than themselves. And so then, as we begin to minister to these people, it's like the Lord began to make me aware of the spiritual forces that were holding them captive, but still I didn't know how to set them free. All I knew is I could start to understand why when they try to come to church, when they try to get their life changed, there'd be a force that would pull them back into the world that, that they weren't able to resist. So in that context, I began to pray that the Lord would lead someone into my life who could mentor me in this area, who had practical experience in this area of setting the captives free. And in that context, about a year and a half later, the Lord uh, introduced me to a man by the name of Paul Cox. Dr. Paul Cox is a Baptist um, a minister. He, he lives in my hometown. And, and, um, and I heard he had a ministry of deliverance. And so he's, he's a Baptist minister who... Who had, who had started out, you know, not knowing very much, but the Lord began to bring people with these uh, life-dominating problems to him, and, and, and as they began to pray and move out in this area, the Lord just began to sovereignly teach him and many, many things. And so, so I got to meet him, and I began to start to, to hang out with him a little. And um, first of all, I, had, I asked him to pray for me, you know, because... I was experiencing some areas of, of, that I wanted greater breakthrough in my life. And, and it was, the prayer time was the most non-eventful thing, you know. He said, on a scale from 1 to 10, this is about a 2, you know. And he says, oh yeah, but there's some stuff leaving and saying some things that I can't, you know, really compute with. And I'm, I'm like, okay, so I had a demon and it's leaving. He says, oh, yeah, more or less. And I said, okay, cool. Do I have any more? Can you kick them out? <laughs> And, but what was so amazing is that these areas that I had been struggling in, and like had been, it's like I'd get three feet forward and then I'd fall down again. And I was sure I'd have the victory. And it's like, 
struggling so hard and having to struggle so hard just to, to maintain the, you know, zero level and never able to move ahead. It's like suddenly it just broke off. And it wasn't, you know how normally when you, I mean, I can't speak for you, but for me, many times we come in and we have a tremendous counter with God and this worship, and it's like, oh, you know the Holy Spirit has touched you and you receive something from Him. But in the next day, you're still feeling pretty good, but by two or three days, it's like it's all leaked out. It's like, where does that go? Well, what was amazing is that for like two weeks, I was just floating. And it's like I'd come to the Scriptures, and before where it was so hard, it's like they were just open to me. And the areas where I was struggling, and it was like it was easy not to sin. And I was saying, wow, there's a level of freedom. This is what it means to be free, and free in Christ. There's a level of freedom that I never even knew existed before. And that people I looked up to, no one had really communicated it before. Everyone, the only thing they taught me is that, you know, you're going to always battle against sin. And I understand we always have to battle, but don't we eventually win? and gain that level and then move on to new things. And so that was pretty cool. But then we got to, to sit, you know, and, and I, this is the way I was. If, if, if I called up every friend I knew who I thought, you know, might have a demon. I said, <laughs> I said, let us pray with you, you know, because I wanted to learn. And anyways, the word got out in this. We were working in a city you know, Atalanta, you have to know Atalanta. I mean, it is, it's like an inner city transposed into the middle of nowhere, you know, and everyone's trying to escape the inner city and they come there with all their problems. I mean, it is a messed up place. You know, poverty, drug addiction, alcoholism, it's really bad. I mean, I don't think you can relate to that here in Minnesota. So this lady called us up and wanted us to pray for her daughter. And her daughter, um, this is an African-American lady, her daughter was 13 years old. And she would have epileptic fits. And when she came up, she'd be another personality. And she would throw, you know, men, grown men around the room. I mean, it was terrible. She would um, um, wake up. Her mother would wake up and sometimes find her daughter lying out on the grass. You know, the daughter would lose time. I mean, you know, and just wander all over, sleepwalk. And it was horrible, horrible, horrible. And the mother had gone to all these different places trying to get some ministry. No one was able to help her. The doctors weren't able. No one was able to help her. And so she calls me up and says, you know, will you pray with her? And I said, sure. <laughs> if Paul comes with me, I'll pray. You know, I wasn't praying. I was just watching the thing, you know. So we set up an appointment for, you know, like a few days down the road. And I say, uh, you know, but watch out because, uh, you know, we found that the devil normally tries to stop these appointments. She calls me up. We were going to meet in that evening. She calls me up that afternoon. She says, Pastor Ted. And I said, yes. She says, you know how you told me the devil was going to try and stop the prayer time? Well, he's, he's, he's doing that. And, and well, the police are here. And so the policeman gets on the phone. And, and, and this is what the policeman, he says, well, all I can say is the devil's in her. And this place was an uproar. And there was this girl, you know, and, she, and no one... And, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, that's all right. You know, just, just hang on and we'll be there when we can get there. So by the time we show up, it looks like a war zone. I mean, this girl has black and blue eyes. And I mean, it, it, the, the house, the police had gone by that time and it just looked like the place was messed up. And here is this little girl, this young girl, 13 years old, who looks like the sweetest young lady. And then this, I watched this guy, this minister who, just a normal looking guy takes her hand and see he could he could discern what was going on in the spiritual realm he could feel it and he looks her in the eyes and he says the lord's going to change everything and then he starts praying for her just as calm as anything and he just says leads her in these simple prayers and says get out now and i'm just sitting there watching this phenomenal thing and he can feel it, and she can feel it, and I just, I'm like in another world, but I'm, and she would like, and she, you know, get so full of fear, and, and then there'd be this peace that would rest over her. And she was just barely, all she could do was barely mutter the prayers that he was leading her to repeat. And it totally blew my mind, you know, it's like, how can that be a true commitment, you know? Folks, 45 minutes later, 
this girl is totally transformed. Totally. And see, you know, you can talk, and the Lord revealed some of the roots and has shown the opening. The opening was that when she was a young lady, her, she had been uh, a young girl, her, she had been sexually molested by her grandfather. Unfortunately, that happens to so many people. And that had opened the door for all of this evil to come in. But see, she had a special gift. She was very, very sensitive to the spiritual realm. So while other people, you know, the same sort of trauma happens to them and they deal with it in a certain way, you know, and they look more or less socially acceptable, but their life inside is screwed up, but, you know, it doesn't look so bad. You know, these, this evil, these demons, wouldn't it just force her and, and to do stuff? She would actually hear them and see them because she had a gift of being spiritually sensitive. And then when the Lord pulled that, pulled that all out, he was just totally, totally set free. The next day she had an epileptic fit. And, you know, she went to, um, she went, th then she went into a home and they ministered to her longer. The next day she had an epileptic fit and they prayed for her and God stopped it halfway through and that's the last one she had. And the last I heard, several years later, she was still doing well in a church and moving ahead. And, and this just totally, totally, totally blew my mind. I had I'd heard about it in the book of Acts. I'd read about it. I'd seen it. But I had never, I mean, I, I'd, I'd seen it in the Bible, but I had never seen it face to face. And this so transformed me. So I want us to go back, first of all, that our inheritance is greater than what we understand. And if you look in Genesis, going back to the origin, where we, we see where man comes from. And God has made all of creation, and then he does something, and he makes something that's categorically different than everything else he has created. And he says, let us make man in our image. I don't know if any of you have heard of Dutch Sheets, but he's a leader in the area of intercessory prayer, and he's written a book, and and in this book, he goes back to this, what it means to be made in the image of God. And he looks at the Hebrew origin of that word. And what that word image means is like mirror reflection. And see, God is sovereign in the heavens. He has this palace and he has these angels and this kingdom and what he says goes. And he is the ruler. And so now God was creating this world, this wonderful world. And so many times we think of the garden as, you know, a nice little place with a couple fruit trees. And No, the garden was the palace that God was creating. It was just the most wonderful place to live. And that palace, the king and the queen were Adam and Eve. And mirror reflection, what it means is if when you looked at Adam, he looked like God. In other words, if you happened to be in the garden, you'd be walking around and you'd walk by Adam and, oh, that's just you, Adam. For a moment, I thought it was God. That is what it means when he made Adam in the image of God. We know that it says in the New Testament that Jesus is the second Adam, right? Have you ever thought of that, that that has a reverse implication? Before the fall, Adam was the God-man. He was the representative of God here on earth. Folks, this is where you come from. You're not going to find out who you are until you look to your Father, until you see Him in His eyes, and you see His glory, and you say, that's where I come from. I want you to turn very quickly to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the fourth chapter, or the third, somewhere in there. The third chapter, the genealogy. And I'm going to touch more on the genealogies here. But what I want to bring out here is this is the place where it's, chase, it's tracing the human origin of Jesus through the genealogy, and it's tracing it through his father Joseph, although he was not actually his father, people thought he was his father, and he was his adopted father in that sense. So it says there in verse 23, Jesus, he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. Okay. Joseph was the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi. And it goes on and on and on, verse after verse. It traces it back to David, traces it back to Abraham, and it keeps on tracing it back. 
And then look at verse 37 there, towards the end. The son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. So it has traced the human origin of Jesus all the way. It says, you want to know who Jesus was? Here is who he was. He came from so-and-so who came from so-and-so. Back and back and back. Until it gets to, and Seth came from Adam. And then look at the next phrase. The son of Seth, the son of Adam, without missing a beat the Son of God. And folks, we have a limitation because of our worldview. We have a worldview that is quite contrary to the original readers of the Gospels and of the original readers of the Scriptures. If you ask somebody who you are in a Western world, who do they say? Well, you know, my name is, uh, Ted's my name and basketball's my game. And we identify ourselves by ourselves. And normally when we look back, you know, we'll hold accountable, we'll hold ourselves accountable to the first memory, the first conscious memory we have. And that's who we think we are. You know, and, and they ask who you are. Well, this is, you know, my name's Ted, and you might give your last name, but it doesn't have that much of significance. And, well, I'm a businessman. Well, so-and-so. And, and our din identity is out of who we are. But if you ask someone who, um, it, it, from the so-called third world, or from Africa, or from China, or from, you know, Latin America, you say, who are you? Well, say, my father's Dale, and his father's Clyde, and his father's so-and-so, and then go on and on. And, and you say, no, but I'm asking who you are. And they say, yeah, I'm telling you who I am. My father's Dale Haas, my... And we say, well, wait, I'm trying to get to who you are. And they say, yes, that is who I am, because they see themselves as part of a group. They see themselves as coming down from who they are. They see themselves naturally as part of their family. And we have, we have a worldview that thinks of I and not thinks of we. So we don't understand that. But the New Testament readers, the original readers of the Scripture, thought of themselves as coming from who they are. And in that context, Jesus is saying, you want to find out who you are? You're the son of, who's the son of, who's the son of so-and-so. And when you're finally going to get to the end to find, okay, this is the inclusion of where I come from, it's not going to be an ape. No, it's God himself in all of his glory looking up and not a foreign thing, not something that you can't relate to, but no, I know who God is. And when I look into my eyes, that is who I am. I am made in the image of God. What that means is God birthed you. This was even before your first birth. And then in the context of that came the fall. So, can we agree that our inheritance is greater than what we've yet understood? Amen? So now we have to see that we're more screwed up <laughs> than we yet understand. You see, God created Adam in his image, and everything was going great. And, you know, so many times we think that the population of the world was an afterthought. After Adam fell, then God said, well, okay, now, might as well have some children, because i got to redeem you, and I just wanted the two of you, but now let's go on and have some more, you know, and we're a whole bunch of unwanted children. No, God told Adam and Eve to come together, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth before the fall came. And I believe that the God had created the whole earth to, to, to house humanity. And the garden was going to be like the palace and Adam was going to be like the supreme ruler and there was going to be this wonderful kingdom that is glorious beyond imagination. But in that context came the fall. And the fall was motivated because Satan became jealous. Became jealous of two people. He became jealous of God. We understand that. He says, I will be like the Most High. We understand that he became jealous of God, right? Yeah. You, under, you know that passage I'm talking about there in Isaiah, I believe, someplace, or Ezekiel. But we don't understand that he was also jealous of mankind. And I believe that, 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 that Satan... I, I, one way I understand this is that Satan, who is the greatest of all the angels, 
was so filled with his own, you know, was so happy to be created who he was, you know, and so glorious. But then when he saw Adam, see, when he says, I want to be like the Most High, who was the one that was like the Most High? Adam. He says, no, I'm going to take his position. And why would God entrust to this human being the rulership over the whole world? I want that. And so he came in and through his deception, see, for him to begin his rebellion, there had to be a legal transaction. And so through deception, he had to trick Adam through Eve into giving away the authority and the dominion of the world. And that's what happened through the fall. And then Satan came in where only God was meant to be. See, God was meant to be the place. And see, Adam was created to be the representative of God here on earth. And so that he would see the will of God and there would be a unity in the way that you know, we see it with Jesus. He did what he saw his father doing. Adam was to have a communion with his father so that he saw and got counsel directly from his father and then executed it here on earth. But then when Satan came in, Satan took that place of dominion and began to abstract worship and, and, and gain adoration from humans, which was never meant to be there, and to then execute His will here on earth when it was never meant to be. And for us to understand the, the depth of our sin, which is a necessary step to then step forward into the freedom, we have another hindrance, which is again because of our worldview. In the West, we have a worldview that dichotomizes things, that separates things out. And the original readers, the Hebrews, have a worldview that synthesizes things. In other words, that sees things as connected. We see things as separated. So when we read the scriptures about what our enemy is, we find out, okay, we know that we battle against sin, the flesh, we also battle against the world, and we battle against the devil, okay? And we all teach about that. But the way we understand that is sometimes I'm battling against the flesh. Other times I'm battling against the world, and sometimes I'm battling against the devil. And so I need to find out whom I'm battling against and then deal appropriately. And then maybe occasionally those three will intersect, and I'll actually be battling on two fronts at the same time. And that's how we normally understand that, because we have a worldview that separates and that dichotomizes. But the original readers of the scriptures, the Hebrews, had a worldview that was much more similar to people in the third world today. And they didn't dichotomize the spiritual world and the natural world. They saw those as connected. We see the natural and the spiritual world as inherently separated. And then when we come to Christ, Many, we bring that unknowingly into our Christianity so that now we believe in angels, we believe in the Holy Spirit, but that was for a separate time. The angels are some one, people that serve God in heaven and on a very, very rare occasion they may interact with you know, human beings and probably most of those occasions were recorded in Scripture. That is coming from a dichotomized worldview that sees the spiritual world as separate from the natural world. But the original readers of Scripture, the ones who it was written to originally, synthesized these things. And they believed that the natural world and the spiritual world were inherently united. And so they believed that people interacted with the spiritual world continually. That is what we see also reflected in the teaching of the, the writers of Scripture. That they saw the flesh the world, and the devil as three different dimensions of the same problem. In other words, every time you're battling against the flesh, you're also battling against the world system. And every time you're battling against the world system, you're also coming against the devil who's behind the world system. And so it's not an issue of one or the other. They're all tied together to some degree or another. And so we have to understand and look at, a, look at these and see these things together for us to understand what our problem really is. Now to give you a scriptural basis of this, I want you to go to Galatians very quickly. Galatians chapters 3 and 4. 
And I want to show you three different passages where Paul talks about these three different areas, but he puts them in parallel, and without missing a beat, he describes them as if, as if he's describing the same thing. Galatians 3, verse 23, and the, the greater context is Paul is explaining, you know, in his way, basically what I'm explaining to you now, the problem we have with sin. And it says in verse 23, Before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. Okay? Do you understand what that passage is saying? What Paul is saying is before faith came, in other words, before you, were, before you met Jesus, you were held captive. In other words, you were a prisoner. A prisoner is held captive against his will. He can't get out if he wants to. And how were you held captive? You were held captive prisoners by the law, locked up until faith could be revealed. In other words, you were held captive and you couldn't get free until Jesus came and set you free. What was it that locked you up? It was the law. The law is what locked you up. Okay? Do you understand that? So in other words, the picture he's saying is that those who don't know Jesus and you before you knew Jesus, they're all captive. They're held prisoners against their will and they're locked up. And the only way they can be set free is for Jesus to set them free. Okay. So it's the law that holds people captive, right? That's what he's saying there. Amen? Do you understand? You're tracking with me? Okay. Now I want you to go to 4, verse 3. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. So he's saying the same thing. He's saying before you were saved, you were a prisoner. But before, it was the law that held you prisoner. Now he's saying, no, it's not the law. It's the principles of this world. In other words, it's the world system that's holding you captive. But wait, he's contradicting. I thought it was the law that was holding me captive. Now it's the principles of the world, the world system that's holding me captive. These two go together. They're two different dimensions of the same thing. Now, go to 4, verse 8. It says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God. Are not gods. Who are by nature not gods. I would submit to you that this is a reference to spiritual forces of evil, de demons who say they're gods and receive worship as gods in you know, pagan cultures, but are, na are not gods. It's a reference to supernatural evil. It can't be talking about uh, natural slavery because everyone he was talking about was not a natural slave. Many of them were free men. But he's saying, before you, were before you were set free, you were in bondage, you were in slavery. And now, what are you in slavery to? He's saying, you were all held captive by the devil. You were all demonized and held captive by the forces of evil. And I also want you to notice that he doesn't say, there were some of you who were so bad that you were also screwed up and demonized. No. He says, all of you, the picture here is everyone who's not born again is held captive by the devil and the forces of darkness. So what we have is we see here that the law, which the law is what highlights our sin, it's the law and our sin go together, we see the power of this world, the principles of this world, the world system, and we see the devil, supernatural evil, and they're all intermeet. They're all linked together. So we have to come to the realization. It doesn't matter, you know, you might not have been into witchcraft, you might not have been into the occult, but we were held captive by the devil. We are battling against supernatural evil. We cannot see our problems in, this, in the context of natural issues. We're more screwed up than we are willing to let ourselves believe. To give a practical example of this, then, you know, with, with this minister, Paul Cox, we had the opportunity to pray for many, many people. He mentored me for about two or three years. Um, and one, and, and on more than one occasion, not that often, but on more than one occasion, we got to pray with people who were coming out of very, very 
uh, large involvement, much involvement, intense involvement in the occult. People who were witches, who were warlocks, who were high priestess in Satanism in a very high level. And one of these guys we were praying for, the Lord began to set free, and it's just a wonderful thing. I mean, this guy was way out there. I mean, he was messed up. And then at one point, when he was being, you know, as the Lord was setting him free, it's like it was all going more or less normal. I mean, if you can say it was normal, and, the, and just God was setting him free and just like pulling this stuff out of him. And then as we're praying for him, he reaches this one point, and it's like in, in the spiritual realm, we could discern that the Lord began to pull out these evil, and what the Lord showed it was, it was stuff that had come over him through sexual perversion. And when I say sexual perversion, that's a very nice term for what they did. But one branch of witchcraft is all based on sexual perversion. And you can find it, you know, in the Old Testament, in the, in the fertility cult. And where they, in the Old Testament, they would go up and they would worship these pagan gods by having sexual orgies and rituals. And it was a very, very perverted thing. Well, that same thing happens today in the underground among the occult. And he was involved in that. And when they wanted to do, the way he described it, this is his own words, okay, is that when they wanted to do a curse or, or to make some sort of spell, they knew they would, ha they, they would have a, an orgy and they knew they had to have so many people involved. And it's like in this iniquity, this perversion, when the act was taking place, it would, this is how he would describe it, it would release this energy and then they would like focus it and through that do the curse. And, I mean, it's a perverted, perverted thing. And when the Lord began to, he repented of that, when the Lord began to pull it out, I mean, the man almost, literally, almost died before our eyes. He began to experience, I believe for three hours, experience intense hell, as through all his life he'd been blinded to what was really going on. And now that he had come to Christ, and the Lord opened his eyes to see it, it was beyond anything he could handle. And I believe he literally, the Lord allowed him to pass through three hours of where he lived, what hell was like. And he says he had been through so much, I mean, you know, the abuse and the story of this man, you cannot believe it. But he says, I had never experienced so much pain as what I experienced in those three hours. It was nothing as when the Lord was opening his eyes and then removing it and pulling it out. These, these, these demons that were attached to these ritual, the, these sexual demons that had come over him, that he had given an entrance through these sexual rituals he was involved in. And that's pretty heavy. That's, you know, heavy stuff to talk about. But you know what really hit me is when the Lord began to show us that people who were not involved in the occult at all just had a worldly lifestyle when they were involved, the Bible says that every other sin a man commits is outside of his body. But when he sins through uh, adultery or through fornication, through sexual iniquity, he sins against his own body. That you open up a door to the same spirits, the exact same spirits, because there are spiritual principles there. And it's not just a natural act. It's not just, oh, an act of the flesh. It's not just, oh, consenting adults. No, you're opening up the door to spiritual evil that comes over you to destroy you. And that those same things, maybe to, not to the same degree, but the same demons were given an opening by people who were just in the world, just having fun, just doing things their way. That was very frightening to me. But then, see, we need to understand the difference between how wide the door is opened and how much comes in through the opening of that door. And we might say, oh, that guy has the door open so wide, and I just barely opened the door, so it's no big deal. A murderer can come in through a door that doesn't have any, a you know, doorway that doesn't have any door on it. And he can come in, but he's a murderer and he's going to kill you. Or a murderer can also come in just because you opened the door a little crack to find out who it is. He shoves his hand in, he grabs that chain that's holding the door, he breaks it off, and he forces himself in through the tiniest crack. It doesn't matter how he comes in. We need to understand, oh, the door might have been open just a little, but an awful lot of evil came in through that door. And the Lord began to break my heart, and this is a message we need to understand, that God was not joking when he wrote the word. That when he gave us the law, it wasn't just some arbitrary thing to try to, 
you know, make us not have any fun. No, he was explaining the spiritual principles that were put into place. And there is a battle that is going on that is far greater than us. And that's why we have to be committed to holiness. So where does all this evil come from? It comes from sin. Sin that opens a door. But when it opens a door, there's a violation of the law. But when there's a violation of the law, see, God had created the angels to be his executives, to serve his kingdom, to enforce his law. So now when Satan rebelled, now he uses the law now against us. And so there's a violation of the law, he comes in, and there's spiritual power that is opened up and spiritual forces that are, now have a right to oppress us. We need to look at the opening, and then when we identify the opening, we can apply the blood of Jesus. And when we apply the blood of Jesus, then we have authority through the power of the Holy Spirit to ask the Holy Spirit to remove whatever was let in. But it comes through sin. But what we have found is that Satan is able to, 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 to it's like a blindness that we have because we don't, when we say sin, and we read the Bible about sin, and it says, confess your sin. Because we think of individually, we take ownership of what I have done. And we don't go any further than that. But see, God wants us to mature beyond the point of who done it. See, when God is trying to tell you about the problem you're in, about how messed up you are, he's not interested in applying guilt and identifying who's to blame. If you want to look to who's to blame, Jesus solved that problem. He says, forget about blaming, blame me. And he went to the cross. God wants to identify it so you can take ownership. It doesn't matter who did it. Who, it doesn't matter who's to blame, whether it's your father, whether it's your grandfather, whether it's your mother, or whether it's yourself. You own it. It's your problem. And so we need to get beyond that. And see, first of all, we need to understand that when Jesus died for the cross, he didn't just pay for your sins, he paid for the sins of others. And that's, we need to understand that, that that means he paid for the sins that others committed against you. That's why we can forgive. Not because what we're saying they, what they did was okay. No, it was very evil. But Jesus died for it on the cross, so now we can forgive them because we have a source of solution. But we also have to learn to take ownership of the sins of our forefathers. When you look in Romans... Let's go there very quickly to Romans chapter 5. I want to give you a biblical basis because I realize some of the things I'm, change, are, I'm, I'm presenting are, are, are new for a lot of us. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. When we began to pray for people, the Lord said, don't look at the fruit. Look at the roots. For example... You might be ministering to a person who's alcoholic. If you say, okay, repent of the sin of alcoholism, and you, know, you pray for them, maybe they might get set free. Probably not. Because alcoholism is a fruit. The root sin has much deeper than that. And, you know, many times it has to do with their own self-image of why they hate themselves. Why is there this void that they're trying to fill with alcoholism? And unless you address these core issues, unless you go to, you know, what, you know, and, and normally it's wounding and address these issues of wounding. And the Lord began to show us, if you go to the roots, you need to find the deepest roots. And when you deal with the deepest roots, then the fruit will disappear. And he began to show us that what happened in a person's childhood is normally the root and is, a, is the deeper root for what they're walking out in their adulthood. And it has to do with woundings and hurts and with pains. For example, that testimony of that young girl. The, the fruit was epilepsy. The root was this molestation. And she had to address that issue, and she had to forgive her grandfather for it and apply the blood of Jesus to it. And so the Lord kept showing us more and more roots. And we began to see that the roots went back to when people were very, very young, even two years old, and things and woundings that had happened. And when they would address those, the fruit would disappear. And then the Lord began to show us, you know, the roots go back even further than you thought. And it says, some of these happened before people were born. 
and we found out that people who are uh, the victim of an unwanted pregnancy or the result of an unwanted pregnancy or that when that mother said, found out she was pregnant, saying, oh no, she gave an opening to a rejection that came over the child and has been following the child all of its life. And when people address these and forgave their mother, many times, you know, the, the mother loved them after the child came, but still there was an opening there and a rejection had come in. And it wasn't just words. No, there's spiritual significance behind it. And when they addressed that and forgave their mother for rejecting them, that was removed, and then they were able to walk in freedom in areas that they had never had freedom before. But then the Lord began to show us that there's even a deeper root. I mean, think about it. Why? I mean, murderers are the sons of murderers, right? Preachers are the sons, so many times, the sons of preachers. Politicians, presidents are the sons of presidents. Go to the prison system. I mean, where are you going to find, where did that kid get, get, get screwed up? And you're going to find out more times than not, you know, why do we have gangs? Because these little gang members are having children. And these children grow up in this context. And see, the child had three strikes against him before he was even born. Where did the root of his problem come from? His family situation, his parents, before he was even born. You can relate to that, right? Well, now, okay, where's the root of that? Go back a little further. Well, why are those parents screwed up? Well, it goes back to their childhood. It goes back to their family. And before they're even born, they were having strikes against them. This is what we call generational curses, problems that are being passed down. And it's not just a natural thing. They're passed down in the spiritual realm. And it's like demons who have a right over the child and that follow them all their life. And where do they have a right from? What happened in the family line? But see, it's not just a vague thing. We have to realize that they're very real in the same way that it's not just sin. No, it's not just, oh, I have a problem with lust. No, you have a specific problem with lust because you chose to do such and such at such and such a time. It's a very real act. And you can't just come before the Lord, oh, forgive me of, and vaguely generalize your problem. No, you have to take ownership of it and say, I did it at such and such a time, at such and such a place, and this is what I chose to do. And that is what bringing the light to your sin is. You tracking with me so far? Well, now it's the same thing with the sins that happened in our family line. We have to take ownership of them and say, oh, it wasn't just something that happened back there. No, it happened so many generations ago. Something very specific happened, and it brought a very specific curse with it. The biblical basis for this, we see here, or one of them in the New Testament, is in Romans 5, where Paul is saying... Why are we sins, sinners? And he's saying, you're not sinners because of your actions. He's saying, no, before the actions even happen, there's a pre-existing condition that was causing you to sin. How far back does it go? Does it go back to your parents? No. Does it go to your grandparents further than that? It goes back and back and back. And he says, it goes all the way back to Adam. And when Adam started it, he brought a curse. And when he sinned, he brought a curse over mankind. And it was like he got the ball rolling. And as the ball got rolling, each generation, each group added to it. See, we have to realize that we were born into this world with an inheritance, as one of our friends say it, of a toxic waste dump. But at the same time we have the toxic waste dump, we also have an inheritance of blessings that God wants to give us. Okay, so, I, so now we can agree that we're far more screwed up than we've yet understood. We're not just battling against sin in the natural realm. We're battling against sin in the spiritual realm. Well, this brings me to the final point. Jesus did more for us on the cross than we've yet laid hold of. See, so many times we think, when I got born again, the blood of Jesus came into my life, and now I can forget about the past, and I can go forward, and He won't bring that up again, and I have a chance to do better. And that's wonderful. 
But that's not what Jesus did for you. You see, because the problem is, is then we bring into our Christian life so much regret. We say, oh, but I wish I had met the Lord earlier because those first 30 years of my life I just wasted. And then we began to encounter problems that have their root of before we knew Jesus. Said, oh, I wish I knew Jesus then. Then I wouldn't have gotten screwed up in that mess. And oh, but now I just have to pay for it and I have to suffer. And oh, and I hope maybe somehow the Lord will provide something better for somebody else. And we bring all this regret. No. When Jesus saves you, He took all the old things and made them new. The blood of Jesus, when it came into your life, what happened 2,000 years ago became applicable to you. And so now, your life no longer relates back to the moment of conception. It no longer relates back to your natural family. No, you were conceived before the foundation of the world in the heart of God. He knew you. He had a plan for you. He knew every problem you were going to face. And He provided the solution for it through the blood of Jesus. And now when you accepted Jesus, all of that blessing came into your life and it transformed all the old things into new things. And it took all the failures in your life and the very thing that Satan has been using to accuse you. He says, now, apply the blood of Jesus to it and what Satan has meant for evil, I'm going to turn around for good. You're not just going to have a second chance. You're going to have an overcoming chance. I'm going to put you at the same level that you can look to someone who you would say is an ideal situation and have no regret and have no jealousy or nothing at all and saying, I lack nothing of good that they have. Do you know that God says, I love you with the same love that I love Jesus Christ? The same love that He poured out upon Jesus Christ is what He wants to pour out upon you. He wants to take those old things. He wants to go back to those woundings and those pains. Those areas that maybe we don't even know about, that we've hidden. And say, oh Lord, you can deal with all these other areas, but don't go there, it's too painful. And he wants to say, no, let me go there. Because that very area of your darkest pain, when it is touched by the blood of Jesus, is going to become the seed of your greatest strength. I want to transform your pain into glory. And not just back to your, your early childhood. He says, let me go back to your family line. Let me take these things that happened long before you were born. Let me take these things that happened that you had no choice in, that you had no power over, and I want to apply the blood of Jesus to them. And now I'm going to set you up on a high place. And I'm going to transform. See, you were born with, all, with these three strikes against you. He says, let me touch that with the blood of Jesus. And now you are going to be experiencing a Christianity that chases after you. You're going to be experiencing a force that leads you towards righteousness that you can't resist. The same way that you were in bondage and you couldn't be set free and you wanted to be set free and you wanted to be a good father and you wanted to get rid of the pornography and you wanted to get rid of the prostitutes and you wanted to get rid of the alcoholism but you were captive and it would just pull you in and it, you went there against your, your will and then it was beyond your strength and, and you knew you shouldn't do it you knew you shouldn't give in but there was just a power beyond you that said there's, there's no hope and just led you there by chains he wants to break those chains and put what the Bible calls cords of human kindness, where the Spirit comes in and possesses you and takes over and says, yes, I know you're weak, but I am strong, and get you to the point where you're compelled to righteousness. Folks, there is that place of freedom. I have experienced it. Well, the, I know it. I know it. What I share the Lord has done in my life, it has not been by my strength. But he comes in oh, and he overrides your weakness. And the issue is, will you trust me? Will you let me love you? Will you come to me? That's all it is. Will you trust me? Will you open up your heart? Oh, folks, the Lord wants to compel you to reach your city where you pass a threshold, where the only way that you won't be able to overcome the trial is by turning around and denying Christ. And none of us will do that. But if you will not do that, He will lead you beyond your strength and you'll reach a place and say, I can't go on any further. But the Holy Spirit will overcome you and He'll push you into righteousness. 
He'll put a hedge around you. That is our inheritance. Dominion. Oh, folks, we have to lay hold of this. We have to lay hold of this. We have to grab hold of it. The Holy Spirit wants to paint a picture of a place that you've never been to, but He wants you to step into it. Do you want to lay hold of it? Do you want to? Do you want to? Well, let's go for it. Can we agree that the blood of Jesus did more for us than we've yet understood? Well, if you agree with me, stand up. Praise you, Father God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look to, lo- look to the Lord. Say, Father God, you are my daddy. I respond to you now. You're showing me your glory. I see your might. I see your power. You created the heavens and the earth. You created the snow. You created this beautiful country we look at. If this shows your glory, and and it's been affected by the fall, how much more the heavens? Oh, but God, I look to your eyes, and I see your love, and I say, Daddy, you are my father. You're not a foreign God. You're not something I can't relate to. You're my Father. I come from you. You created me. Your word says, and I believe, that before the foundation of the earth, you knew me. I am wanted. I am planned. I'm not an afterthought. You planned me. Oh, God, I love you. Father, I humble myself before you. And I acknowledge now that my problem with sin is much greater than I've yet understood. But right now, I humble myself before you and I confess my sin. I confess the sin that I'm personally responsible for. Every failure, every act of rebellion from the earliest age, every act of anger, of covetousness I humble myself before you and I confess it thank you Jesus you died on the cross and paid for all those things in full I confess my sexual perversion every act I cover it with the blood of Jesus. Father, I forgive all those who have sinned against me. What they did was wrong. I acknowledge that. It hurt me. It wounded me. It nearly destroyed me. God, you know my pain. I choose to forgive them. And I don't hold it against them anymore. Because of the cross of Jesus. And I receive the blood of Jesus. And I apply it to each of these situations. And I declare that what Satan meant for evil you are turning around for good this moment and I ask you to restore to me now everything that was good that was taken away from me or that I gave away restore it to me make me pure again make me holy again 
Father, now I renounce the sins of my forefathers. We renounce the worship of false gods. We renounce the rebellion against you, God. We renounce trying to find fulfillment in every way other than in you. God, we're guilty. Our forefathers did that. And Lord, I recognize now that I'm suffering because of it. I acknowledge that. And I thank you, Jesus, that when you died on the cross, you prayed for every iniquity, every violation in my family line from the beginning of time, from the fall of Adam, back to my great-grandparents, to my grandparents, to my parents, to the present. You paid for all that. And it's covered by the blood of Jesus. So now we take authority and we say to you, Satan, the legal right you had because of the trespass is now broken. And now we call against you a greater law, a higher law, the law of grace and mercy of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we declare that through that cross, God calls us holy, the righteousness of His Son, blessed, free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, pour out your blessing. Pour out your blessing. Pour out your blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I break the chains. I break the chains. Oh, we break the chains. We break the chains. The chains that have been pulling your servants, your children into, the, into iniquity, into bondage, I break them now in the name of Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus. Father, the chains of shame that have, that have been telling people you don't deserve anything better. This is what you deserve. Oh, Father, I break those chains now. Father, release your love through the power of your Holy Spirit over every person in here. Empower us to live righteously. Empower us to live holy. Let us taste of the freedom that Jesus paid for on the cross. Oh, Father God, I cry out to you. Lord, we see a day when the nation of America will look to the church and will see freedom. We'll see your Son. We'll see the grace. We'll see the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father God, let it begin with us. Bless us, God. Bless us with freedom. Bless us with dignity. Bless us with restoration. Restore, Lord. Restore, Lord. Oh, those who are hurt, Lord God. Lord, those who, in this room, Father, from the moment of their earliest memory, they look back and all they see is rejection and hurt and pain. Father, break that. And now rewrite your law upon their hearts where they look back at their life and they say, yes, that happened to me. But that happened to a person that is no longer me. And they see the blood of Jesus in those places, not just with their mind, but with their heart. And where their heart can respond and say, now I know my father, I know my daddy, and I know his love. And those things don't, matter at all anymore oh father anyone in here who's been wounded by their natural father 
Lord, I pray you highlight that. You bring the light to that incident, to those incidents, Lord God. And Father, now write upon their heart that they know that it was not their father who did that. It was their natural father. And that their real father provided through his son a redemption and a healing. Oh, Father God, apply the healing to those wounds now in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus.